it's finally over. As I sit here typing these words out on the laptop with the ocean spray splashing my face, I almost can't believe it. The last few days have felt like nothing less than one long continuous nightmare that I could never awake from. It's what I imagine it must be like for someone in a coma locked in endless sleep. But you know her and me, it is over. Before I tell you what happened, let me just say one thing to all of you reading this, all of you who did all you could to help me and gave me advice. Um, and I've said it so many times now that I probably sound like a broken record, but I need to say it one final time. Thank you. I will never forget any of you for everything you did for me. And if I can ever return the favor, I will. That being said, it's time. Time to tell you what happened. When the three of us woke up, it was still dark out. According to my wristwatch, it was only a little after six in the morning. None of us said a word to each other, only exchanging nervous but determined glances as we packed the things we thought we'd need into a single bag, including all the food and water we had left. As I shoved the final things in, Andrew came up beside me, holding out another sheet of paper at which he had written something. Nate, I'm so, so sorry that you... I read the note and looked up at the man's somber face. I still felt the angry heat in me, but I pushed it down and simply nodded at him. Now, wasn't the time to hold a grudge regardless of whether it was deserved or not. I took the pen and wrote a message back. Let's just focus on getting out of here. Nothing else matters. He read it, then nodded, seeming a bit relieved. I cast one final look at the program, which had been shoved underneath the door last night. I lay on the room's writing desk, the declaration of reaching court, staring up at me like a tombstone. Freedom or death, I thought. One of them happens today. Stealing myself, I motioned to our barricade, which had gratefully managed to hold through the night. Um, trying to remain as quiet as possible, we pulled the chairs, nightstands, and other items away until um, the doorway was clear. I took a deep breath, feeling a mixture of fear and anticipation begin rising. Then reached out and took the doorknob in my hand. I looked up, locking my eyes with Andrew and Spencer. They slowly um, nodded at me. Okay. I turned the knob, pulling the door open in silence and crept down the hallway. It looked as deserted as always, though the shoes still sat next to the cabin doors. I became aware of one difference from yesterday, though. Something that made the fear and uneasiness um, increase. The intercom had been turned on again sometime during the night. And as I listened, I realized the first ever song that had played when we powered the ship up was filtering out from the speakers. You belong to me. I shivered slightly, but listening to the music strengthened my resolve. Yeah, we'll see about belonging to you fuckers. Making sure the bag over my shoulder didn't make any sound, we entered the landing. The first thing I noticed was that a sign had been set up next to the floor's concierge desk. Um, I stopped for a second to read it. Next to it was an open ledger inside which many people had signed their names. Um, they were along with their cabin numbers. My eyes flickered down the list, seeing many names that I didn't make out. Ones of people who had passed from this world decades ago or longer, and then I froze. It felt like someone had dumped the frigid seawater down my back. 
my eyes read and reread the last three names on the sign up list. I saw Will's name. The captain's name, that's not really like this. And I closed my eyes and turned away from the ledger and feeling as though my emotions were about to overwhelm me. And seeing his name, knowing that all three of my crewmates were among them now shattered a piece of my soul, especially because I knew there was nothing I could do for them. And not now, they say. Someone patted me on the shoulder and I opened my eyes, turning to find Spencer standing beside me. He wore a grim expression on his face and looked from me to the ledger, having seen the same horrific sight I had. For a moment, I did nothing. And then I nodded at him, turning to follow him and Andrew up the stairs. And the lifeboats were hooked up on the promenade deck, which is where we were heading. But the plan was to uh, hide the bag of supplies near the stern railing of the ship behind a few of the giant cleats uh, used for mooring. Then ready all the lifeboats on the starboard side of the ship to drop. Normally they would slowly do lowered from the, the davits via steel cables. But I had noted there was a sort of quick disconnect switch which would allow the small boat to simply free fall to the water. All of us knew damn well that the moment the ship's inhabitants realized what we were doing, they would send everything they had after us to stop us. And that meant the second we launched of the last of the lifeboats, we would have to quite literally run for our lives to the stern, snatching up the supplies before leaping overboard. And so from there, it was simply a matter of making it to one of the lifeboats, climbing inside and rowing like mad away. The idea conjured up an image from an old horror, 80s horror movie I'd seen about a possessed ship of it turning to run down its escaping prey. It was replaced by the horrific sight of the Queen Elizabeth coming about to do the same to us. I pray to God that it doesn't decide to do that because we'll be sitting ducks. Shaking the thought and the image from my mind, we reached the top stair of the promenade deck. Looking around, the music continued to play, the song changing to seed. Mr. Uh, Sandman by the Shordettes. Uh, aside from that, though, the ship was silent in the gloom, which meant that they hadn't caught into our playing net, and that gave us more of a framing chance. I spared a split-second glance at the captain's bloodstain and turned towards the opposite direction. We're doing this for you, Cack. All of you. All of you? I whispered the first words any of us had uttered that day. Motioning to them, I knelt down into a crouch and slowly began moving down the corridor, the two following close behind. As we reached a corner, a sign hanging overhead, pointing in the direction, which showed the way to the outer deck. Something filtered out from down the hall in the other direction, in the direction of the, the theater. It was the sound of laughter, not eerie, sinister laughter, but the genuine infectious laughter of people who've been bowled over by something hilarious. Even still, the sound sent chill after chill down my back. They're watching a movie, I realize. For a moment, I wondered if our lost crewmates were sitting beside them, watching. And I shook my head. I jerked my head, putting my finger to my lips as we reached the door to outside. Feeling my entire body tense up, I reached out, grabbing the handle and slowly pulling it down. It opened. The smell of the ocean immediately rushing into my nostrils in the hall. Moving quickly, we stepped outside and closed the door behind us, Andrew using the door shut as quietly as he could, but he finally spoke, his whisper almost torn away by the whipping wind. All right, let's get the supply bag down to the stern and then get ready. This place is going to pop off 
when everything starts. Spencer nodded. Let's do what he whispered. So together, um, you know, the three of us descended a few sets of stairs um, until we reached the stern deck. Thankfully, it seemed as deserted as the rest of the ship. Um, moving quickly, we scuttled over and set down the bag. Step one was complete. As we slowly began to back away, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up straight. I froze as the shiver, which came with the sensation of being watched, passed over me. My heart began to beat hard and fast in my chest. Shit. Swallowing, I slowly turned and looked at the mass of decks over our heads, expecting to see a shadowy figure staring down at me. No one is there. What? What'd you see? Andrew hissed at me. I stared out for a moment longer before shaking my head. Nothing. Nothing. I just thought we were being watched for a moment. Their faces paled slightly at my words, but they nodded. Come on, let's get back upstairs. We need to prime the quick releases on the lifeboats, then do one final check to make sure they're not near us. Then we do it. His saw the color begin to come back to their faces. The fearful looks melting back into the determined ones they had had until now. I shot a look off the side of the ship. The sun was beginning to raise itself over the horizon. The orange glow giving way to the yellow glare as it looked to be pulling itself out of the sea. So turning back, I jerked my head forwards. Let's go. We made our way back out to the promenade deck and began readying our potential escape vessels to drop. It was extremely, almost painfully slow going, um, especially trying to get some of the hinges uh, had formed patches of rust, making the davits hard to swing out and the levers even harder to raise. But eventually, every single lifeboat on the starboard side of the Queen Elizabeth dangled high above the water, which moved by below. Uh, the three of us stopped for a moment to wipe our brows, and we allowed ourselves a small smile at our accomplishment. We might actually make it out of this. Uh, we might actually pull this off. The thought sent a surge of hope, almost getting us to flow through me. When I got back home, I'm going to literally kneel down and kiss the ground beneath my feet. And I'm never setting foot on orientation again. Now came the final task, uh, making sure that uh, the coast was clear and uh, I know we hadn't been spotted and swarmed. Um, none of us had discussed this portion of the plan yet, mostly due to um, the fact of, of what it entailed. Um, one of us had to sneak back inside the ship and give a last look and signal the others to begin releasing the lifeboats. None of us wanted the less than envious task and yeah, didn't blame the others for not volunteering. But after seeing that neither of them were going to step forward, I sighed. All right. Uh, I'll do it. Simultaneous looks of guilt and relief entered the other men's eyes. And after a moment in which I saw them inwardly fight with themselves, they nodded. I began to turn away when Spencer spoke, he made. I looked back seeing the barely disguised fear on his face. Matt, fear for him, for me. Yeah? I asked. And he took a deep breath and then answered. Stay safe, man, please. A small bit of gratitude at the gesture flooded me and I nodded at him. Just be ready for my signal. And with that, I opened the door and slipped back inside. <clears throat> Tension filled every fiber and sinew of muscle in my body as I crept forwards, hearing the pounding of my heart inside my eardrums. The sweat began trickling down my face. Everything seemed the same. The music still played over the speakers and the ship 
still remained silent. I didn't hear the laughter anymore, but that could just be because whatever phone they were watching wasn't in the middle of a funny scene right now, at least I hoped. I took another few steps towards the T-junction ahead, straining my ears for any abnormal sound. Still, it remained quiet. Maybe they really don't know what we're up to. Keeping my breathing as quiet and shallow as possible, I finally reached the T-junction, taking a single deep breath before stepping out into the middle of it. I cast a look in all the directions I could see. Nothing moved in the stillness. Time to leave. I turned and gave the two faces and the door's porthole a thumbs up, then crossed my arms and made a slicing motion. Both of them burst into elated grins and disappeared, dashing to begin dropping the boats as I turned to join them. Uh... The voice from over my right shoulder um, froze me on the spot, my feet rooting themselves to the floor. Um, every ounce of hope and happiness I had was sucked away from me like a loved one in the grip of the tsunami, replaced by a mixture of horror, fear, and dread. Oh, fuck! My breathing became ragged and I felt tears begin to spill from my eyes. Slowly, I turned my head to look behind me. Will stood there, looking as alive and human as he had the last time I'd seen him next to the pool. He cocked his head, slowly giving it a shake as a sad, pitying smile played over his lips. It was a valiant effort. I'll give you that. You've impressed me. He jerked his head towards the door, leading outside to the last hope of my salvation. Especially getting those two bird brains to work together with you. The second voice spoke up from my right. But the game's over now, Natalie. And my head swiveled to see that Diana now stood between me and the exit. And she wasn't alone. And what looked like at least a dozen men, women, and children stood beside and behind her all wearing clothing from the mid-20th century. They all wore amused smiles on their faces. When their eyes fixated on me, behind them I could hear the dull funk of the lifeboats being released. Uh, my dear boy, Nathan. Uh, the biggest chill yet ran up my spine, and I slowly turned around to find three of the four hallways packed with people, hundreds, no thousands, which stretched away and out of sight, wearing not only old clothing, but crew uniforms as well. And then my eyes fixated on the man who had spoken, spoken with the voice I'd heard through the radio that second day, welcoming me aboard. He was dressed in a captain's uniform, a white cap, sitting atop his head. I knew instantly who he was. It was the man that Andrew and Spencer had seen. I tried setting on fire and then running from the captain of the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, he smiled an ear-to-ear -ear smile that reminded me of the Cheshire Cat from Alice in Wonderland. Only this grin wasn't going to be followed with raising any philosophical points or trying to cheer me up. This grin held a wicked hunger, and it made me feel as though I were staring at the devil himself. And then the two figures stepped out beside him, two figures that made the blend drain from my face. The captain spoke again. I think you know what to do now, everyone. And I finally wrenched my mouth open and screamed screamed with all the air in my lungs as I watched him, Vinny, the captain, my captain, and all of them melt into the shadowy figures that had stalked and pursued us from the day we'd stepped. I was aboard and wait for them to make a move. I turned and ran. <laughs>
I ran in the only direction that was available to me. Um, back down the hallway that led to the lounge and the stairs. And sparing a glance behind me, I screamed again as what I can only describe as a maelstrom flew after me. The maddening whispers, screams, and laughs emanating from them melting together into what I can only assume is what hell itself sounds like. Running faster than I ever had in my life, I reached the landing and made a dash for the stairs. But I'd only taken a few steps down when I heard even more of the infernal noise rising up from down below. I peered over the banister and down the space between the stairwell, and I felt a new surge of terror as I saw even more swirling figures surging up the stairs. Shit, I yelled, turning and sprinting back up the stairs. And so I emerged back onto the landing just as the figures which had originally started chasing me entered. Black soot-like arms reached out to snatch me and I ducked, managing to dodge them with less than an inch to spare. And I ran towards the open door to the lounge, my momentary thoughts of running for the observation room squashed as I heard yet still more whispers coming from around the corner of the hallway to it. I had no other choice aside from turning around and letting them take me. And that was not happening. I burst into the lounge, almost tripping over one of the chairs that still lay on its side and racing for the crew hallway we'd first entered the ship from. Um, as I made it to the center of the room, I could see it, a door hanging slightly open. Um, I'm gonna have to make it, it's my only way to escape. A momentary surge of hope filled me as I reached it, heaving it open and then died as a shadowy hand thrust out from the darkened companionway trying to snatch me and pull me in. I stumble backwards, almost falling as I turn to run the other way. So I was really funking my hands. Panic and fear were what was solely driving me now as I made it to the middle of the room. And I was completely surrounded. I spun around in a circle, feeling the strongest wave of horror burst forth as I saw the shadowy figures had made a circle around me. There was nowhere left for me to run. I began to shake uncontrollably as I watched them slowly close the circle more. Tears began to fall from my eyes as the grim reality of my situation slammed into me. And then anything, there's nowhere for me to run anymore. Nowhere for me to go. I'm not getting out of this. I'm gonna die here. I just hope Spencer and Andrew managed to make it off. And then one more thought. I closed my eyes. May my eyes shot open, flicking over the shoulders of the shadowy figures as they stopped, stopped and turned back to look at Andrew and Spencer who had dashed to the doorway of the lounge, panicked looks on their faces. Their eyes found mine and I saw their faces go pale as they saw my situation. And then to my horror, some of the figures turned and began to move towards them. They began screaming, hey, I'm here. You wanted me, come take me, leave them alone. The figures turned back to me and I heard the whispers morph until the only sound I could hear was them laughing. That's when I heard Andrew scream at me. Nate, look out. I look up to see him pointing his finger behind me. I spun around, catching a glimpse of something rocketing towards me. With a terrified realization, I recognized it as one of the um, giant lamps that had been you know, set up in, in the four corners of the lounge. And at the speed, the huge marble and glass behemoth was traveling, I would be killed 
instantly, if it hit me, it was what was meant to kill me. I didn't think there wasn't time to. I simply turned and dove for the floor. So I as carpet slammed into my face as I felt the monstrosity whiz less than a foot over my head. Seconds later, I heard it slam into the opposite wall with a thunderous crash. And for a moment, I could do nothing but lay there. The shock of not being dead, all I could feel. And then I got to my feet. Andrew and Spencer's faces wore horrified expressions at how close I'd come to death. And they could be nothing but stare at me. But as they did, I realized something something that sent a bolt of hope through me. Um, some, of the, some of the figures were still moving towards the two men, quite a few of them, in fact. Enough that they had made a mistake and uh, left an arrow, but noticeable gap in the circle. I ran. Instantly, the figures realized their error and attempted to plug the hole in their line. But they were just a moment too slow as I managed to spring between them, feeling the tips of their fingers brush the collar of my jacket. A new sound rose from them as I flew out of their grasp. One that spurred me to move faster. A single, unanimous scream of rage. Rage at having had me dead to rights and then letting me slip out of their grasp. As I broke free, I shot another look up towards the others. I'm in ready to yell at them to run, to head for the stern of the ship. But I saw I didn't mean to. They were already bolting for the exit. I felt fresh tears begin to well up in my eyes. This time, ones of hope. I crashed into the corner as I saw them ripping open the exit door, sheer adrenaline towering me on as I raced to catch up to them. Come on, you're so close. Move. I spared a look behind me, fear adding more fuel to my escape as I saw the mass of figures spill around the corner I'd just come from. They were desperate to keep us from escaping. I slammed into the door, yanking on the handle as it flew open. Um, the sun momentarily blinding my eyes it slammed into the outer wall with a crash, and as I caught sight of Andrew and Spencer racing down the stairs, they shot a terrified look back at the sound. I was too focused on staying ahead of the horde to say anything. The only sound I made being the labored breathing as I took the stairs down two at a time. The stern section came into view as I reached down the final set of stairs, and I saw Andrew snatching up the supply bag. The screams of anger and desperation behind me now filled the air, drowning out the cry of the gulls overhead. I saw my two crewmates take two bounding steps, jumping and pushing off the stern railing with their feet. Then they disappeared out of sight. Uh, a moment later, I jumped as well. The frigid cold water took my breath away as it enveloped me. For a moment, I thrashed underwater, then my head broke the surface. I sputtered out seawater and looked around. The lifeboat. I saw that our plan had worked. At least half a dozen of the small boats had successfully survived their fall and floated away from the ship. Um, I began swimming for them as hard as I could, seeing the others do the same. And behind me, came the biggest scream yet, and I scared a glance over my shoulder to see the Queen Elizabeth steaming away from us. For whatever reason, they couldn't pursue us. The sight slammed the reality home to me. We made it. We're free. Moments later, we reached the closest one and hauled ourselves on board. For a few moments, we could do nothing but lay there gasping for air as the sun rose higher in the sky. The warmth that radiated down felt like heaven to me. And then slowly, I heard Spencer begin to chuckle triumphantly. Andrew joined 
in a moment later. And finally, so did I. And it was all we were able to do, being so mentally and emotionally fried from what we'd experienced. You know what? I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't lie to you. And after all you did for me, you know, that's what you wanted though, wasn't it? Um, you wanted to read about how uh, the three of us managed to beat the odds, managed to escape the nightmare ship, and are floating somewhere in the Atlantic that we're gonna be all right. Am I right? Um, well, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to burst that bubble. <laughs> I can imagine you sitting there now, all of you reading this. Wait, what? You'll scream. A shocked expression on your faces. He lied at the start. But did I? Well, I said at the start that it was finally over. I said what I felt was a nightmare was finally over. I never said I escaped, though. You only took it to mean as much. Um, the truth is, everything I just told you actually happened. Until the point where I turned to see the giant lamp flying towards me. I never dove out of the way. I didn't have time to. It slammed into me with the force of a Boeing 747. I can still remember it. Remember flying across the room before being crushed into the wall. And truth be told, it was so quick that I didn't even feel anything. I didn't suffer if that makes you feel better. I also didn't lie about standing up to see the horrified looks on Andrew and Spencer's faces. They did indeed have horrified looks. And they did look back terrified as I slammed open the door to chase after them because I was rushing after them to tell them how wrong we'd been, how wrong we'd all been. I realized that as soon as I stood up, looking down at myself and seeing the shadows clinging to my body. They were right. Will, Diana, the captain, they were all right. About it being beautiful, about the past not dying. The other reality, all of it, there truly was never anything to fear because I feel so happy. I never have to worry about death again about growing old. I never have to worry about things changing, about the world moving on, and whether I want it to or not. And to tell you the truth, I feel a so silly for being afraid this whole time. I find him the most popular sane. Uh, if I'd known the truth, I, would, I, would, I never would have run from them. Uh, I would have let them take me. I didn't lie about them escaping either. Like Andrew and Spencer, I mean, they really did leap off the stern of the ship into the water and swam to a lifeboat. And I can still see them now, actually. I can see them trying to row away as I lay on a sun lounger on the promenade deck. The mothers, the laptop I left in our cabin in my lap. Diana and Will are smiling and laughing together as they share a drink on my left. And... Vinny and the captain are lounging on my right. My heart warms as I see them shooting smiles, almost as warm as the beating summer sun. But I can't help feeling sad for Andrew and Spence. They're never going to be able to experience this. Just like Wyatt and Kenny won't. I even asked the captain of the Queen Elizabeth if they could return, if I could try and convince them to come back to us. But he said because they'd tried to burn the ship down, it wouldn't be possible. As much as that sucks, I can see his point. And, but I can't help but feel a little bit bad for them. Seeing their little lifeboat get farther and farther away as the storm rolls in to swallow them up. I hope they don't suffer too much. Um, um, we're so close to arriving in New York City now. I'm so excited. When I look 
over the railing towards the bow, I can see the first glimpses of it on the horizon. And it looks so amazing. Seeing it as it did as it is in 1956, without any of the ugly modern buildings ruining it, Diana told us that she's going to show us around. And then she's going to take us to her home in Los Angeles, and he's where we're even going to go see Elvis perform. And I can't wait. After the traditional horse race and party tonight, of course. Which brings me to something I want to tell you all about. You see, Diana also told me that when newcomers arrive, they do have to do something. They need to contribute to help them. The Queen Elizabeth will eventually leave New York, heading that out for open sea. She'll cruise between here over to England and then back through the Atlantic where we first came across her. Crossing from this world to our, to yours, and to the tether that the floating hotel for sister ship became, because after enough time, the four of us will stop being new faces to everyone here, and they'll stop being new faces to us. And it gets ever so lonely not seeing any new faces, so I'd like to do something for you. Or I finally lose the signal. Um, the computer has back to you before we fully cross over. The entire reason I'm posting this last update. I remember at the start, and I said if I could ever return the favor for all you've done, for all the advice, if I could do anything in return for you will be in such kind hearted people, I would. Well, there is. I'd like to extend all of you an invitation. If you're able to charter a boat and sail for the Flemish Cap, or for the route the ship used to take in your world across the Atlantic, look for the darkened storm clouds and steer a course for them. You'll be battered about a great deal. Unfortunately, it won't be pleasant. But you'll eventually see the great ship appear on the horizon. Steer a course for her and come on aboard where we wait to welcome you with open arms. We're always looking for new people to join us.